Good morning. Thank you for being with us today. We're so grateful to have you here. But it is a bittersweet day as I say goodbye to you as your pastor and become the pastor of the Southern Province. So it's an intimidating thing to take on that role. And we've been preparing for this for about seven weeks as a congregation. And in that time, I've been preaching a series to get ready for this moment. So if you don't take it all in today, the beauty of the service is it's live streamed. You can go back and hear it later. And you might need to do that today. A couple notes about our service today. It will not conclude with the benediction, which Robert Dean will do for us. That We're going to stay put in our seats and listen to Sing Hallelujah uh, performed by our band as a postlude, and then go basically to the fellowship hall and outside the fellowship hall for a reception. And we'll direct you all to that, uh, where to go when that uh, point in the service arrives. Between then and now, I invite you to worship. It's also my privilege once again to share with you that beginning next Sunday and for the duration of our call process, we are uh, grateful to welcome to the pulpit Robert Peterson. He served as an interim for me in 1994, and he returns, and I think you'll love uh, Robert as a pastoral person. He'll be with us on Sundays as well as two days a week, like a, a Wednesday, Thursday, and so look forward to seeing Robert and Sarah in the near future beginning next Sunday. Make sure there's anything else I need to tell you. I think that's it. What I've been doing the last couple Sundays uh, is to share with you watchwords that are important to me. And I think there are verses in Scripture that are like the gospel in a sentence, the gospel in a verse or two. Now, when I say that, it's the dangerous thing to say because it might encourage you to only read that and forget about everything else that's in Scripture, such as John 3, 16 and 17 are one of those examples. I believe 1 John 4, verses 10 through 12 are incredibly important verses, not so much as doctrinal verses, but as a compass point setting for your life on how you see things, how you process things, how you say yes to God's call in your life. As we consider that, let us stand and sing together hymn number 675, What Brought Us Together. Please join me in a time of prayer. Oh God, meet us here and now. 
in this place, in this space. We're gathered in your presence to worship, to reflect upon the week we've just lived, to seek again a measure of your love and your grace. Enough to sustain us for the week we have to live. Oh God, you turn your presence loose upon us that each of us and in each of us that we might go to where the edge is to face with you all that we struggle with, our fear of loneliness and pain, our desire to be sustained with hope and joy enough for this moment, our longing for a future filled with certainty and the assurance we will find the meaning we need. Oh God, part of our purpose for gathering for this specific occasion is hard to name, for it is an ending. It marks a conclusion of nearly six years we've shared as a congregation and pastor. These are six years that have challenged us all to face our limits and our opportunities. We've welcomed new expressions of ministry and learning and outreach. We've wept together at the passing of friends and family. We've celebrated new mountaintop experiences of your grace and love. We've felt the heartbreak of distance and isolation from an unprecedented pandemic that still lingers. How awesome it is that you, the God who created each mountain and ocean and the galaxies that fill the night sky, cared to create each and every one of us. That you decided your design would include each of us that you have a place for each of us in your ongoing expression of grace and love for this world. As I consider the highs and the lows of these six years, I can see without any doubt that you've been in this place, working through this congregation to reach out and to receive expressions of grace and love. At times, in spite of all the challenge, at times turning them into opportunities to reveal your presence, at times proclaiming to us, in us, with us, and through us the wonder of Your mighty grace. Lord, what comes next may seem unclear and veiled in mystery, but You are never failing in Your presence with us, and that will never be at stake. Remind us of that often. Help us to hold on to Your presence in our midst as we move forward, although on a somewhat separate direction. I trust You to guide us to the right path. Reveal Your Spirit. Reveal Your light and Your way. Fill our leaders with understanding and discernment as they seek to call the next permanent pastor to Grace Moravian Church. Fill me with all that's needed for my new role within the Provincial Elders Conference. Above all, allow the bond of kindness and friendship between us to remain strong and true, just as your love brought us together twice. Let our shared love grow and sustain through the years to come. Gentle Shepherd, it was always you who have led us personally and collectively. We trust you to care for our needs in the immediate future as our mutual paths now take different directions. Help the boards and the people of Grace Moravian to face together the mystery that lies ahead. Grant them grace to wrestle with your leading spirit until they're able to name their fears and are set free to move into new chapters of ministries with you. To wrestle with the call to love this neighborhood around them where now the majority are self-defined as having little to no religious affiliation to see with new eyes and fill with renewed hearts the same gifts that have always been a part of this church's history, to befriend the friendless, to share hope with the hopeless, to weep with the grieving, to find new ways to enjoy life and fellowship with those who thought joy was no longer possible, all while seeking to continue on the path of deeper worship, deeper discipleship and disciple-making, and deeper service, especially beyond the walls of this hallowed space. May we all rediscover the mystery of wrestling for meaning with You until we all grow deeper in gratitude.
for all that you're bringing into our paths each and every day to remind us of your presence, your grace, your love, and how each of us are part of your great mystery of hope and blessing to this world. In the name of Jesus, amen. Today's scripture reading is from 1 John 4, 10 to 12, from the Common English Bible. This is love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us this way, we also love, ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God remains in us, and his love is made perfect in us. This is God's word for the people of God.
those children who would like to be a part of Children's Church are welcome to leave the sanctuary at this time. So in the past couple of weeks, the board has asked me to share uh, when, what would normally be the object lesson part of the service, some backstory of what they've been working on. And today I'd like to end with telling you uh, a bigger story than just the work of the board of what went on during COVID. So I want to take you back to March of 2020. I know that seems like about 15 years ago. It's disrupted everything from getting together to celebrate the birth of a new child. How many, how many of you had a birth in the family, but you had to delay getting to see that new child, that grandbaby, that person in your family? Or weddings and all the other things that normally we get to celebrate. We had to delay all that. And then there's Christmas and birthdays and the whole nine. You know, in March uh, 2020, when our governor decided that we needed to shelter in place for our own safety, we came this close to worship not being what you saw. Just Pastor Neil on his iPad and throwing something together each week and hoping it works. And I was almost ready to pull that trigger out of safety, and another group of people in church convinced me not to do that. So I'm going to give the, uh, the first person I'm going to tell you about is Kathy. And you have the best music director in the world. And I do not say that lightly. I joke with Kathy all the time that we need to start a reality TV show called The Preacher and the Organist. And you start some kind of thing, a wedding, a baptism, an Easter service, a Christmas Eve service, and something goes awry and we can't talk to each other verbally. And we either have to use mental telepathy or some kind of like third base coach thing so it looks like it was supposed to work out that way. I've never worked with somebody that can read me better than I can read myself and allows me to do that with her in the middle of a service. So it was Kathy who said, Neil, let's stop and think about this just a second. So the limit is 10 people in a room, and if you think about it, most of the time our worship team is limited to a smaller group than that. I think we can honor what the governor's saying and still pull off a really awesome service. But it also meant that we needed uh, Mark Coleman and his team in the, in the booth upstairs, especially Bryce, Bryce and, uh, to come together and figure out how to go live stream. And we figured that out pretty quick. In fact, in time, we'd figure out how to do Sunday school live stream and some other things. But between Bryson and Mark and Kathy, and let, let me not forget Jim Littleton, who never missed a single service, we kept going. It also meant we had to change the style of worship a little bit. And, I, and Joe Harrell, I think it was you who came to me one day because things were, were kind of getting there with, with uh, your wife. And you were saying, you know, Neil, your, your way of speaking it speaks directly to me. I said, well, there's a point because I've changed trying to speak to an audience to just this camera. And I'll think of somebody that I'm trying to talk to. And I hope that's what's coming across. But it was Joe's encouragement to me that helped me fine-tune that a bit. And I think in a strange way, COVID has made our worship better. I say that because on an average Sunday, 170 people watch this service. Look at how many are in this room, and then add 170 people to that. It's pretty interesting. And sometimes we get communication from other parts of, uh, that aren't here in North Carolina, and it's in interesting to hear that. Now, the other piece that happened was you can't pull the choir together, and what's Grace Braving without choir and bells and those bigger ensembles? And so again, Kathy figured out a way to keep the music going and to feature the talent of so many talent, talented people in our congregation, from the Grace Notes to uh, that wonderful brass band to the lower brass folks to particular um, musicians who play their instruments like Nick Freitag or uh, folks that are vocalists, and on and on it went. And for you at home, I know that you appreciated that because I could see it, first of all, in your stewardship, but in your comments. So then COVID kind of did a couple different hiccups and whatevers, and we were looking at coming back together in the fall of 2020, and with Kathy's help and Ms. Sean Coleman's help, we pulled together a team that would meet virtually to figure out, how do we do that safely? 
The CE committee became sort of a built-in group that was also a place to process that, and they never missed a meeting, even though they met virtually throughout all of COVID. What I'm trying to tell you is, it wasn't a couple leaders that pulled this off. It took an army. It took an army of small teams of people that could process things in real time that were very messy, not sure how it's going to totally come together. And by the time it all did and God showed up and blessed it, it was awesome. Including two Christmas Eves in a row where we did something very different than what we're used to. I hope you see the parable in that. God can do anything. But He chooses to do what He does through you. So what if the future of Grace Moravian Church is not about the pastor you're going to call, it'll be a big part of that, or the board leaders that are going to be a part of that discernment. What if the real future is each and every one of you stepping up to find that thing, that it, that you enjoy to do to give God's grace and love to another soul? It might be through being in the band or in a committee or some mission team we've not invented yet. And I hope it's the stuff we've not invented yet. But the more you're involved in ministry through the week, the more this grows. So the thing that we need moving forward are leaders willing to develop to be the kind of leaders we currently have, and then some. So to Jim and Kathy, to Mark and Bryson, to many of you, thank you that we did not give up. With that in mind, let's stand as we sing together our next hymn. Come Holy Spirit and fill our hearts with your presence. Remove from us those things that distract us, those fears and doubts and worries, that checklist of things we need to get done today. Help us lay it all aside. 
and hear clearly what your voice seeks to say through this scripture and in this moment. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I've been borrowing from Brian McLaren an image of the spiritual journey to a deeper, more faithful relationship with God that we should be pursuing as long as we can breathe. That's taken from a resource he calls Faith After Doubt, and he talks about these four stages. Now, you've also heard me personally speak in a more complex way that you have in a spiritual journey an infancy, a childhood, an adolescent stage, young adult, middle adult, older adult, and there's actually some after that. And as good Moravians, we believe if you're breathing, you have still more to work on. You don't have time to judge other people. But the process of moving through those stages, it does include moving through what, Brian, and Brian McLaren's just repeating what a lot of spiritual uh, wise people have said through the millennia, that we move through simplicity, then there's complexity, and then there's perplexity. You know, when you suddenly, the things you thought were true get challenged. There's more than one answer to things. And then you face heartbreak and loss and perplexity to finally harmony. He says this too, that there's a couple things to consider when we're thinking about harmony. And I, I defined harmony last week as something that uh, creates a pleasing arrangement, like listening to a musical chord. It can be congruence or agreement or accord, and my favorite is an interweaving, like the way the team came together to keep our worship going at the beginning of COVID. It was harmony to watch. But it was a result of moving collectively together through what was, what was like before uh, COVID. Things were fairly simple if you really think about it. And then it got really complex, and then it got really perplexing, and we had to sort it. And we did, and as we did, we found a new level of harmony. Brian McLaren also notes this, that the stages of spiritual uh, growth uh, are also cumulative, and I've never heard of this word before, iterative. That means as we move through them, it's like the rings of a tree. So you just got through simplicity, and then things got complex as you started school, and then you got into junior high, high school, got really perplexing, might have gotten in trouble then. And then you found a little bit of harmony, and, and, and you think, what's next? Another level of simplicity, and then complexity, and then perplexity, and then another level of harmony, and then it happens again. It just keeps getting, keeps moving through. And you start to see these are tools for seeing why. So I want to take you back to um, uh, uh, one of the greatest eureka moments of my life. So in the pilgrimage tradition, in our pietism of Moravian tradition, we talk about this living a balanced life is built on three things. Giving our hands to God, giving our hearts to God, giving our minds to God. And when you do it in a balanced way, it's the doing of it becomes something you can't really describe until you're engaging it. So here's me as a freshman in college at a Southern Baptist University, Mars Hill, and they were struggling back then, the Baptists, with inerrancy and a bunch of ridiculousness about interpreting Scripture. So the way the religion department dealt with that is they taught us all to read Greek. And until you can read New Testament Greek, you're always reading somebody else's translation. I hate to break it to you. And they wanted us to read it on our, uh, for ourselves. And so in that process, what struck me was, especially in the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John, is all this talk about love. And what's interesting in Greek is there's five words for love. It's not like English where there's just one. And the one that's mentioned the most in the New Testament is agape love, and it's just got so much texture and depth to it. So I'm, I'm starting to discover that this is my head part of piety coming to life. And at the same time, the most disruptive, traumatic loss to that point in my life, my closest friend suddenly died in a car accident. I could have been crushed. It could have been over. I could have given up. I could do what comes natural to human development, which is to go back to simple. This was a cousin. Go back to simple in our early childhood and just pretend to repeat what was comfortable before the loss. 
That's not what happened. In that deep perplexity, God helped me see a harmony you cannot see unless you embrace your pain. Now that journey with Greek New Testament stuff continued for four years, and in the second year, uh, the trial by fire was you had to interpret or translate all of 1 John. And I don't know how that scholar knew if you were faking it or stealing from somebody else. He knew, his name was Tom Sawyer, can you believe it? <laughs> and great New Testament scholar, but you had to do it on your own. And here, here I am poking through, poking through, poking through, and I get to 1 John 4.10. And all of a sudden, in a moment, it all made sense. Hear those simple, basic words. And this is agape love. Here's the source of this love that holds the world and the universe together. The, the, the source through which all things were created. Uh, stop trying to figure out where it came from, what it means, and whose fault it is, whatever. It just comes from God. Deal with it. And before you had a chance to ever know God or love God, God loved you. Now there's something else, and this is my favorite part of that Greek class. It made all the homework worth it. Uh, Tom Sawyer taught us about uh, enigma words. You know what an enigma word is? It's a word that only shows up once in the New Testament. So they're dangerous because they're usually really important. But what we typically do is we go from being uh, scholars of exegesis, which is what we're supposed to do. So you figure out what the text means, and it's more complex than I'm making it sound like. You figure out what it meant when it was first written, and you try to use that as a, a lens to understand what you're trying to un, uh, make meaning of it now. What we typically do is eisegesis. So a lot of TV evangelism is eisegesis. You figure out what you want to convince people of, and you take the Scripture and you manipulate it to that purpose. So enigma words are really important, and unfortunately this word helosmos has been translated in some pretty destructive ways. And God sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sin. I, when I, I was in a fraternity and I would torture the pledges that were pledging the fraternity, I'd make them look up helosmos and, and, and try to figure out what propitiation and expiation mean. A short definition from the King James, propitiation means God's really angry and God wants to punish somebody. In my reading of the New Testament, that is not true. The RSV didn't do much of an improvement. It chose expiation, which is like a, a no-fault divorce. I would not describe our fall from grace as a no-fault divorce. It just is. It's a mystery. So the NIV came along and said it didn't try to describe it, just the outcome. What was the result of God being incarnate in Jesus and living through Good Friday and Easter for us? We were brought back into one with God. He built a bridge. And that's not the important part of the passage. You get down to verse 12, and anybody that's been on a mission trip knows what I'm talking about. When you're able to allow yourself to love other people unconditionally, but particularly the work team that you're on that's fussing and struggling and working through a week of mission together, and it's going to be messy, and you're going to get on each other's nerves, but somehow you stick it out and it works at the end, guess what you were really building? Not a house or a ramp or whatever they ask you to do, but you were reflecting to these people you were serving what agape love looks like in flesh and blood. And 1 John 4.12 says, No one has seen God, but if we love each other like this, it actually implies they do. They see God in you and me. And there's a bonus prize. And the more you choose to do that, because we're imperfect and we won't do it perfectly, and we won't do it consistently, but when you choose to do that, that thing that God chose to build in you becomes more complete, more full, more on point, more on target, more what it was supposed to be. One of my greatest privileges of being your pastor during COVID was I still got to walk to the office every day, no matter what the weather was, and that put me in a position to get uh, attaboys and thank yous from this broader neighborhood watching you, watching this church, put up a blessing box, do community meals, uh, by delivery and now by drive-through, 
do the, the Luffies that we've done different things. One particular Sunday morning, it was like on the verge of snow, but it didn't snow. It was super frigid. One of those mornings, like, you're really going to go walking on Sunday morning like you always do? Yeah, I'm going to go walking on Sunday morning. And it's gotten to the point that when I walk on Sunday morning, I do not look like this. I look like I'm going to a gym. Or I look like halfway, like um, maybe I need some help, depending on what I'm wearing. There's a particular guy that rides his bike down the street every Sunday that says, hey, Pastor Neil. Tell your church, keep on going. There was a stranger who pulled up at the the, uh, corner here one Sunday morning about the time Blessing Box really got going to to, uh, say first, hey, pastor. And I'm like, how does he know? I I look like I've been changing oil in a car. How does he know who I am? Us pastors, we're paranoid about that sort of thing. We think we can be incognito. We know we can't. Tell your church, thank you. For giving the rest of us an ability to love this neighborhood through your blessing box. Oh, what a privilege it's been. So when it comes to harmony, I'm probably always going to compare this church to that word for me, not because we do it perfectly, because when we're challenged, we show up. So like I said last Sunday, my first thing I give God praise for is we did not quit on each other. We kept it together. It looks different. It's going to be different, but that's life, right? It keeps going on, but it's different. The second thing is that I give praise to God because even though we didn't give up, we continue to find other ways to show up for each other. Some of the strangest ways we did that was with funerals. Funerals happen. We really didn't have more funerals than normal in a normal time frame. But we're getting to the point in the life of our church and the age of our members where almost every funeral is emotionally significant. I'm going to use one particular example, and that was Doris Mills. Doris passed, uh, and we had that service a couple days before Christmas Eve that first year of COVID. Somewhere along the way, we figured out how to do Facebook Live for funerals, which if you'd asked me about that before we ever did it, I thought it was super tacky and the wrong idea. And we did that for Kirk Cooney the first time, and 150 people watched the funeral because they could not physically be present because COVID was so bad that summer. But Doris Mills was something else. 400 people watched that funeral before Christmas Eve. The beautiful thing about putting stuff on Facebook Live is it's there forever until somebody takes it down, and, and people will go back every now and then and look at that. I don't think we've ever posted a funeral that there wasn't at least 100 views, but 400 was pretty crazy. The thing I I admitted only to Kathy and Jim Littleton and the people on that team is if we could have done Christmas Eve on December 24th, 2020, I could not have. I was spent. Not that I had lost anything. I was just spent. And I put everything I had into what I wanted to say, Doris's graveside. And thank you, Lord, that we had a vehicle to share that with a lot of people. Uh, but you know Hubert, he still wanted the band to come together Christmas Eve. And I don't blame him because I'm a bandsman. It rained that Christmas Eve, you remember? And we decided, well, let's just get together on this porch. We'll play. It's going to rain. Let's do, I'll just get my iPad. We'll do it Facebook Live. If people want to watch it and not drive over here, They can see it. It's going to be good. And the band showed up and we had us a good little Christmas concert on the front porch. A, we weren't thinking about the neighbors that could hear it that aren't part of this church that were deeply encouraged because that happened. Thank you, Hubert. And B, that 2,500 people would watch that Facebook in the following week. You think that's crazy? Then here comes Sandra Weevil and Tina Cockrum, who are great teachers to little people and now have uh, people in their life, nieces and grandchildren that they want to read to couldn't because of COVID. And they said, hey, if we read a book and like film it, could you put that on the church's Facebook page? Sure. This week I was passing off all that Facebook responsibility to get and I was showing her the postings. And there's a way to look at those sorts of things by what's been seen the most. And what's right at the top of the list are two women that like to read stories to children who have gotten right off the bat like 1,700 hits or 
2,000 hits because they're reading a beautiful story to children. You hear what I'm saying? You're showing up. You're doing new things. You're reaching out. You're being creative. Keep doing that. But let the agape love of God, that unconditional love that forces you to choose to give it without wanting anything in return, to give it whether the person you're giving it to deserves it or not, and even if you have baggage towards them, to give it anyway. And trusting that in the giving, two things are going to happen. You're going to see God because you risked yourself. Possibly somebody else is going to see God through the risk you took. And most importantly, whatever God's doing with you is going to go to another level. This is what the world needs. It's love, people. It always has been. It always will be. The only variable is will you keep showing up and letting God move through you. One expression that we have in worship every Sunday is to pray for people. And so I want to invite you to a moment for us to do just that, to lift up our prayer concerns today. So join me as we pray together. Lord, thank You for the privilege to pray, and particularly to pray for the needs of our community, our friends, our family, our church members, and those far beyond our church. We lift these folks up. We know the list is not complete, but we do so in full trust that it's in moments like this that You choose to give feet and hands to the very things for which we pray. So inspire us, Lord, to know what to do as we lift our concerns to You. For John Holt, for the family of John Cockrum at the passing of his mother, for Lavinia McMillan, for Linda Niskern, Robin Simmons and Irene Simmons, for Jane Needham at the passing of her husband Bill, for Mike Bowman, for Granville Sidner, for Juanita Rogers, for Frank Greenwood and Tommy Pendleton, for Bernie Epperson and Charlie Hall, for Ed O'Connor and Betty Epperson, for Susan Hyatt and Polly Holder, for Ramona Ruth and Dale Ruth, for Fred Yates, for Joyce Carter, Susan Strauss and Rose Hartzog, for Ian Harrell, for Jacob Brown, for Everett Tolbert, for Doris Scott, for Eddie Weevil, Shelby Hunter, Marlon Mabe, for Dale Baker, for Sam Moser, for Sam Smith, for Danny Strauss, for all those for whom we pray that we have not mentioned we lift them all to you, Lord, in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. A couple comments before we sing. When our hymn is over, please just sit and receive the, the uh, postlude the band is going to play. Robert Dean's going to lead the benediction. When that's concluded, I invite you all downstairs to the fellowship that's going to take place and just follow the directions of the ushers uh, once the postlude has concluded. Uh, this tune is familiar. It's Durwall. You'll, you'll, um, you'll, it'll come to you as you hear it sung. The words are new. So apart from my family, my oldest friend is the Reverend Dr. Riddick Weber. We've known each other since we were five. Riddick wrote the, the words to this hymn. They were used um, most recently as the concluding hymn of Synod when I and Riddick and the other members of the Provincial Elders were commissioned. And I thought right there that we need to sing this for this occasion. So join me as we stand together to sing our final hymn. It's in your bulletin.
worship into our new week. May the God who sustains us, the God who dares us to hope, the God of transitions and new beginnings help each of us to see the opportunities and the potential in the days ahead. And may each of us strive to be faithful in each and every opportunity that our Lord brings our way as Christ continues to make us new. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen.